You pay attention at school, you study hard, get a good job, work diligently through your career, all so that one day you can just kick back and enjoy a nice pleasant retirement. That's the story anyway, but it's not one that always lives up to reality. There are countless stories of people with good jobs and diligent savings patterns still needing to work well into their twilight years. This is to say nothing of people that unfortunately never have the privileges of higher education or a stable career. Recent reports have found that less than 30% of American workers are on track to retire at all, and even fewer think that they will have a comfortable retirement, and they might be right. I know you didn't want to hear this, but there are a few big factors in the world today that are acting to keep most younger generations in the workforce indefinitely. This is all before considering the major hiccup that the COVID-19 pandemic has been. A global event that has actually worked to widen the gap between younger generations with fewer assets and more precarious employment versus older generations which tend to be more secure. Now, you might think that you are different. You contribute to your 401k, save diligently, subscribe to How Money Works, and even invest regularly into the stock market. Well, that's all great, but I might still have some bad news for you. There are lots of issues at play here. Housing, the stock market, and a series of broader economic conditions which might threaten the general assumptions we make about indefinite growth. So it's time to learn how money works to find out why we will all be on that grind until we are 120 years old. So the obvious first culprit is housing. Affording a home has become a major challenge for most workers in the USA. I know this problem is nothing new, but there are still a few very important factors that people don't consider. Even very high income earners that graduate from top universities and go into fields like investment banking or big tech tend to be moving to equally high cost of living areas like New York, Chicago, or San Francisco. Pew Research recently reported that a majority of young adults between the ages of 18 and 30 are now living at home with their parents. The median age of a first home buyer in 2019 was at 34, and experts agree it's almost inevitable that figure will be pushed even higher by the pandemic. What's more is that young buyers tend to be purchasing smaller dwellings like apartments and townhouses rather than traditional freestanding family homes, not because they don't want to, but because they can't afford it. This is a real issue because most financially secure people will tell you their house is their biggest asset. This doesn't just mean it's the asset that they own that's worth the most money either. Owning a house means you don't have rental expenses, and even if you are paying a mortgage, those payments will at least partially be building up equity in the home itself. What's more is that once the mortgage is paid off, you have somewhere to live with very little ongoing costs. Retiring with a home means that even modest retirement savings or a pension can go a very long way when compared to someone who will need to stretch those payments to cover rent. If a homeowner is running low on cash in retirement, it could be as simple as downsizing their family home, a luxury not possible for someone who hasn't paid off their home or doesn't own one at all. Now, let's be generous and take this median age of 34 to buy a first home, stick a 30-year mortgage on top of it, and suddenly, even this generous assumption of a regular young worker is in their mid-60s still paying off a home loan. And this is assuming that this person never upgrades their home or renovates or does anything to increase their mortgage from the original one they took out over 30 years. The particularly morbid amongst you might think, well, the boomers have to die and leave us their homes eventually, right? And, well, yeah, I guess so. As unpleasant as that may be, it is a reality. The problem, though, is that this will likely only exacerbate the issue. We saw this in our video on why family fortunes disappear. Inheritances that could actually fund a retirement tend to go to people that are already pretty old and wealthy themselves. Now, again, the unaffordable housing issue is a debate as old as modern capitalism. But maybe this isn't an issue anyway. Maybe you are still unconcerned because you have plans to fund your retirement even without a house to call your own. Well, okay, let's put those plans to the test. The stock market is the other major vehicle by which people fund their retirement. Even fixed income pensions ultimately rely on the growth of these markets to provide incomes to their members in retirement. But this assumption of endless returns may be under threat. To understand why, let's consider a simple example. 10 lumberjacks are working at a sawmill that creates frames for residential homes. At the moment, the lumberjacks are only using basic hand tools, but if they all work hard and nobody slacks off, they will meet their quotas. One particularly astute lumberjack takes a portion of his paycheck and over time uses it to fund research into motorized tools. 
His money was well spent because he eventually invents the table saw. He then saves up a bit more of his money to buy the materials needed to build nine copies of his new contraption. He then gives these nine table saws to his colleagues who had previously been using those hand tools. This boosts their productivity enough that they can still meet their quota even if the first lumberjack doesn't show up to work at all. This is what we call capital investment. And it's how, at least in theory, we can sustainably fund people's retirements. The same amount of frames are made, the other nine lumberjacks don't need to work longer and harder, and the first lumberjack has been properly rewarded for his creation with a nice cushy retirement. Of course, this is a very crude example, but in reality, most people do the same thing just through the medium of the stock market. Companies raise money through an IPO or an add-on offering and then use that money to purchase capital equipment which will allow their workers to effectively and efficiently produce goods and services for the economy. But let's go back to our oversimplified example. Problems start to arise when more of these lumberjacks get the same bright idea. One might invest into a forklift to make the work of nine men possible with just eight. And then another might do the same with nail guns to make the work of the remaining eight possible with just seven and so on and so on. But every time this happens, it gets a fair bit harder to find that next thing. Eventually, you are going to need an almost fully automated production line, and even then, you are probably going to want at least one worker to oversee this operation. Every human you take out of the equation and replace with a piece of capital becomes more and more expensive, especially when compared to some other alternative investments. Let's say Lumberjack 5 will need to invest millions of dollars into a robotic arm in order to effectively retire while still ensuring the quota of the lumber mill is met. He might just say, fuck it. What I'll do instead is just buy a factory and require the remaining four workers to work an extra 10 hours a week to pick up my slack while I go and retire. Now, this guy sounds like an asshole, but just think. How many hours a week are you working in your job to just cover rent? This investment into non-productive assets, as in assets that don't actually assist in adding value, is a major hurdle. Now, the classic example of a non-productive asset is something like gold, bitcoins, Pokemon cards, and of course, real estate. Now, real estate is weird, because unlike these other non-productive assets, it does produce income without needing to be sold, and it does this through rent. Investing into real estate has been a particularly attractive investment for a lot of people, which does two things. It increases the price of real estate, causing more of this issue we saw in the first part of this video, but it takes away from investments into the types of productive assets that can sustainably fund retirements. There is one other problem beyond this as well, the overinflation of all asset markets. Let's take a look at our original example of those table saws. They were machines that made cut up pieces of wood. Let's say they chop up 20 pieces each a day. Now, let's replace those table saws with shares. These are effectively machines for making money in the form of dividends. Let's say each share makes $20 a day. In both examples, the lumberjack would need to own 9 of each to be able to fund their retirement. 180 pieces of wood would replace their job at the lumber mill, and $180 a day would replace their income. So either works just fine. Now, counterintuitively, problems arise when those assets become more expensive. Most people think stocks getting more expensive is a good thing, and it is for the people that already own them. Imagine each share was trading for $10,000. Saving up $90,000 is a pretty tall order for a lumberjack on $180 per day, but it is certainly possible over a working career. Now, imagine those same shares were trading for $100,000 while still paying the same $20 daily dividend. If you already own those shares, you would be feeling great because your on paper net worth has grown handsomely. But our lumberjack now has to buy $900,000 worth of shares to fund his retirement, which is just not realistically possible within his working career. Now, this might sound like a far-fetched example, but it isn't. It's exactly what's happening today. To see this, let's look at the price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500, a collection of the 500 largest public companies in America. Historically, it has hovered around a multiple of 15. This means that on average, the stock price is 15 times the company's net income. Today, that multiple is sitting just around 50, which is the second highest it's ever been in history, falling only behind late 2008, which, as you all know, was a time of widespread economic prosperity. In plain English, this means that people are going to either need to invest three times as much to fund their retirements, or rely on the next biggest idiot to buy their shares off them in retirement for a 100 times PE multiple, 200 times multiple, 1000 times multiple, which, by the way, certain investors are already doing for some stocks. Now, you might say, oh, well, shares aren't like table saws with fixed outputs. 
these dividends can and likely will increase in the future, right? And sure, that's almost guaranteed. But it's still unlikely that we will ever see widespread PE ratios under 20 again for two reasons. First, if a company does start paying out consistently high dividends relative to its market price, well then investors will buy it, which will push up the price, meaning that it won't be a great deal anymore. Market forces are a bitch. The second reason is a bit more complicated, but it's one that has some leading economists genuinely concerned. Robert J. Gordon is an American economist who published this paper with the National Bureau of Economic Research. Is the US economy growth over? Faltering innovation confronts the six headwinds. It's a fantastic paper that is surprisingly readable even to people without a strong economic background. But spoiler alert, Gordon basically argues that the past 200 years of innovation and economic growth were more of an exception rather than the rule that we should expect to continue indefinitely into the future. Limitless growth in a finite world? You do the maths. Gordon basically argues that this generation is the fifth lumberjack. All the easy innovations that drastically improve productivity have already been made, and even gradual improvements from here on out will either be very expensive or just rent-seeking in nature, working more to shift value around in new and creative ways more so than actually working to create any. If this rather bleak outlook wasn't good enough, Gordon argued that this would coincide with what he described as the six economic headwinds. These are forces that will act to slow growth in economies around the world for at least the next hundred years. These headwinds are the loss of the demographic dividend. Basically, the economy saw a huge boost when women started to move into the workforce between the 1960s and the 1990s. Now, most women in developed countries work a professional career similar to their male counterparts, but that's just the status quo now. We aren't ever going to be able to double the workforce again unless, well, you know, we make people work later and later in their lives. The second headwind is the loss in educational attainment, particularly in the USA. Education is becoming more expensive, less comprehensive, and increasingly irrelevant to the requirements of the modern workforce. A three-year degree simply does not mean as much as it did 50 years ago, not to an individual or the economy as a whole. The third headwind is rising inequality. A touchy subject at the best times, but Gordon was surprisingly pragmatic about his approach to this issue. The paper noted that incomes were, on average, increasing by around 1.3% per year, but that growth was heavily focused on the top 1%. The remaining 99% only saw income growth of around 0.75% year over year, not even enough to keep up with inflation. That means that if this trend continues, it will be inevitable that larger and larger pools of workers simply won't have the financial means to save for retirement. However, if you are in the top 1%, you can say, nah nah nah, your video title is wrong in the comment section below. The fifth headwind is energy and the environment. The growth of the past century was driven by fossil fuels, a cheap, easily transportable, incredibly efficient source of energy that could power everything from automobiles to jetliners. But of course, they are a finite resource that have come at a cost. This cost will now be paid by younger and younger generations, either in the form of environmental regulations that slow down industrial output, or from complete environmental collapse that will also slow down production. The final headwind is debt. Household debt, government debt, corporate debt, it's all been growing steadily over the years, and eventually this needs to be paid back. This is ultimately going to result in the requirement for more income or less spending. For the government, producing more income is easy. They just tax more. But for individuals and businesses, the only option they might have is spending less. If someone is already running on a tight budget, then those regular contributions to a retirement account might be what ends up getting sacrificed. Gordon did present a likely outcome to alleviate this six issue for all parties. And you might be able to guess what it is. Yup, push back the retirement ages. Now, if this has all been bleak for you, and you still think that you are going to make millions overnight, then good for you. I will have to work harder at crushing your spirit the next time. But until then, you should learn on what to do with your overnight fortune by watching our video on exactly what to do if you suddenly make a lot of money. Of course, step one will always be to like and subscribe to keep on learning how money works.